Mayach, everybody. Welcome, Michael Sandel. Nice to have you with us, Michael. Good to be with you. For those who don't know, Michael is a leading philosopher in America today. He is not only the professor whose classes at Harvard attract more interest and attention and attendance than uh, perhaps any other, not just in any given semester, but perhaps in, in recent memory. Uh, Michael is also uh, someone who is probably the single person in the world today that can pull together people from all countries all over the world to engage in the moral questions that face us as our capacities outpace the questions of whether we should be doing the things we're capable of doing. Specifically now in this remarkably challenging time of this pandemic, we decided to frame tonight's session and we're very grateful for Michael's presence, not only as a dear friend of mine and of the community, uh, actually it was Michael who was on the committee that brought me to KI 25 years ago as, as, as well, very dear friends from Michael and Kiku and Adam and Aaron, their whole family. Uh, but uh, Michael is, uh, is also someone who uniquely is positioned to be able to engage these moral questions that are very, very germane to our time specifically. And the broader context for this Chag Shavuot that we hope is going to be meaningful and a meaningful immersion in Torah Yossi Klein Halevi from Jerusalem last night, Chancellor Eisen earlier uh, this evening. With Michael Sandel now, we are going to address the question of what's a life worth? Specifically, COVID demands meet Sinai commands. The framework for this session, which will last until 9.15, is the first commandment of the ten where God self-defines as the one who brought us out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, whereas some people throughout history might have looked at slavery as a source of shame. Our people were taught through God's Torah to see our experience in Egypt as a source of empathy and humility. And it is the context of those moral values that I want to begin the conversation I'm going to ask about four questions, and then we'll make space at the end for those who'd like to ask to do so. First question for you, Michael, if I may. A lot these days is being talked about the re-entering of our society, and there is no question that we are evaluating human beings these days based on the potential threats and risks that are associated with the infection of COVID-19, the coronavirus. And what seems clear moving forward is that there is going to be a group of people who are immune, relatively immune from the virus. And then there's going to be another group of people that is going to be potentially very much at risk. And then there's going to be everybody in between. We'll call those three categories for now. What does it mean and what are the moral implications of valuing human beings based on their immunity from COVID-19? Well, it's a fascinating question, Bill. And before I turn to it, I just want to say what an honor it is to be here with you to um, celebrate the Chag, to celebrate Shavuot. Um, I suppose it's hard to say Chag Sameach at a time when the pandemic is looming over us, but what you've created here this evening as a kind of inventive way of bringing us together and learning Torah, um, I think can be a source of... So I really want to... Um, salute the leadership that you've displayed in bringing this congregation together um, in a pastoral way, but also in a way that really enables us to celebrate the Chag and also to do this, 
studies, the, 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 the all-night studies that have always been a part of Shavuot. So thank you for, for your leadership, Bill, and compassion and the sensitivity with which you've led us for so many years. Uh, on the question of, sorry. It means a lot. Thank you, Michael. The question you pose about immunity is a fascinating one. It's a medical question, it seems, in the first instance, figuring out who's immune, will we have an antibody test, are the antibody tests accurate, how accurate are they, what are the false uh, negatives, uh, how much should we worry about that. These are medical questions and we hear quite a lot about them uh, lately, even those of us who don't ordinarily concern ourselves with public health and with medical matters. But as your question suggests, there is a, a deeper, bigger moral question that the prospect of immunity testing raises, because the purpose of immunity testing, at least on some scenarios, is to create immunity passports that would essentially enable some of us to go back to work, to go back to school, to go back to the campus, to rejoin the economy and the society, while others of us are relegated to the kind of isolation. Now, there is something morally significant, maybe even morally redeeming to the condition we find ourselves in now when we lack the knowledge, the person-by-person -person knowledge that immunity tests would provide. Of course, there are urgent practical reasons to try to develop such tests. And uh, of course, to develop a vaccine and to develop treatments. But immunity tests raise a special, uh, especially important moral question because one of their purposes is to decide who can be full participants and who will be on the sidelines for, for legitimate reasons, for reasons of health. Not knowing, as most of us don't know for the moment, what our state of immunity is or our state of resistance or vulnerability is, creates a condition in moral and civic terms where we are mutually dependent and all vulnerable. It creates a moral condition in which we can fairly say we are all in this together. Mm -hmm. And the more precisely we are able to differentiate ourselves from the standpoint of vulnerability and risk and immunity. In some ways, that will be a great blessing. But in other ways, it takes us out of a condition that almost commands a kind of solidarity, hmm. not knowing who is vulnerable and to what degree from a common threat does create a kind of solidarity when we can differentiate one another with scientific or medical precision. And so much of what has driven us apart in recent decades have been sources of differentiation who have been the winners and who have been the losers of globalization. Now, during COVID, during the pandemic, who are those of us who had the luxury of working from home and holding meetings on Zoom? And who among us are those who have to risk their health and their lives every day, enabling the rest of us to stay at home? I'm thinking not only of the, the doctors and nurses and, and um, medical professionals in hospitals, but the cashiers in the grocery store and the stock clerks 
and the warehouse workers and the delivery workers and the sanitation workers, they don't have the luxury of working at home. And all of us depend on them. They are the essential workers, as we call them. And yet it's hard not to notice that the people we now call essential are the workers who tend to have jobs that are rewarded the least during ordinary times and who are now enabling the rest of us uh, to work from home. So a sense to go back to, to your question, Bill, about immunity, the, the ability to differentiate from the standpoint of immunity is a double-edged sword. It would be a great boon for practical purposes, but it will also be a kind of moral test to see whether we can preserve a sense of mutual respect and, uh, and, and a sense of mutual dependence and solidarity even when we know who is at greater risk and who is immune. Mm. Does, does that make sense, do you think? It, it does, it does, Michael. It makes a lot of sense, but it also sort of requires, it seems to me, that we recognize, which many of us, I can speak only for myself, which I have not fully recognized until you just said it so, so well, that the fact that we're in the common predicament right now yeah. Yeah. will make that predicament uh, uh, make us miss this time. And, and the appreciation, it seems to me that it's gonna there's gonna be a requiredness on some level for modeling of what is an appropriate posture, a right. compassionate and empathic posture, a humane posture to the right. notion that that we are going to be engaging in this kind of stratification. Yeah, and you mentioned you mentioned in in your introductory remarks the idea of humility, the humility before God who took us out of slavery in the land of Egypt. Sometimes not knowing, not differentiating our status, whether it's for, with regard to slavery or to vulnerability mm. to a pandemic, sometimes not knowing exactly where we stand can be a source of humility. It reigns in our tendency to hubris. And then when we to some degree from that shared condition of vulnerability, then really comes the test. Mm. The test came for the people of Israel with, with freedom, with exodus into a kind of freedom. Because the shared status is no longer quite so self-evident. And maybe there's a parallel here to the moral test that uh, effective and accurate immunity testing will confer, where we will suddenly be able to differentiate ourselves to a degree we can't now. And it'll be a test whether we can preserve the humility that supports the solidarity that comes from a sense of sharing a predicament. That's powerful. I like that a lot. And... It brings me to another question that's actually related to a forthcoming book of yours, something you've been teaching about a lot lately, this, what you call the tyranny of uh, meritocracy. And it's a conversation you and I had a couple of weeks ago that relates to humility as opposed to smugness, right? Okay. And, 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 and just to bring others up to speed, which I know you'll do when you offer a response, the notion that so much of what happens in our world is outside of our hands. Judaism is constantly telling us, you dig a hole, you fall into it. We are responsible for our acts, right? There is a system of consequences that are associated with mitzvot versus uh, transgressions. 
And we're constantly being told that we not only are responsible for our actions, that's part of freedom's responsibilities that the children of Israel come to realize when they go from freedom from slavery to freedom for the law in Sinai, which we celebrate on this night and this next couple of days on Shavuot. And yet, we're aware that so much of our lives, especially now, perhaps, that's where I'm going, given the last few months and this reality that none of us brought about, so much of our lives is not in our hands. When we're right. born, who our parents were, where we were born, what our IQ points are, our DNA. Right. All, all, there are so many examples of things that are either, depending on one's perspective, a complete and utter gift, or by chance, or by contingency. And the, the question that you're going to be addressing in a forthcoming book this fall is how it is that people who work really hard and earn what they have achieved, how easy it is to lose the sense of humility yeah. and say, yeah. I've worked really hard. I have, in this meritocracy, I am coming out really well. I must deserve it. The person right. I've just stepped over on the sidewalk who does not live in a home and who faces a very, very different existence. If I deserve where I am, they must deserve where they are. Right. That's the smug response, right? And, and just to drive this point even more home, uh, I was talking to a couple recently. They are both writers. And in, in the last few months, in this COVID period, uh, one of them writes for sitcoms and they're out of work. And the other one happens to write for animated television and they've never been mm -hmm. busier. Mm -hmm. And the idea that one of them picked one particular kind of writing and the other picked the other kind of writing is just pure chance. Right. The question I want to ask you is, is it your impression that because of this global phenomenon unprecedented where all of humanity is aware of this virus and responding in one way or another to it all over the world. Do you think this is a greater appreciation, a greater sense of humility emerging uh, around the things that are out of our hands than may have been the case hmm. a half a year ago? I would like to think so, and I would hope so, but I'm not so sure, Bill, because the most powerful tendency of our time, if we think about attitudes towards success, the way we conceive who are the winners and who are the losers of, of the global economy, the, the thrust of our way of thinking is to banish to a very large extent the sensibilities you mentioned just a moment ago, an awareness of gift, chance, luck, fortune, blessings. Almost everything in our social and economic life, especially over the last four decades when inequality has been widening, almost everything teaches us to consider that those who land on top are responsible for their success. They've earned it. And therefore they deserve, they deserve all the rewards that flow from it. And by implication, and you gave the poignant example, those less fortunate must deserve their fate as well. It must be something they've done that's landed them there. Now, this tendency is very powerful. And it, it goes back to the stories of, of Genesis and Exodus. Uh, we see it throughout the, uh, the Torah. We see it really up to the book of Job where the impulse is 
to think that if good things happen, that must be a blessing for something good we have done individually or collectively. And if there is suffering, that must be punishment for something we have done. When Jonah went on that ship and there were stormy seas, the first question that came to people's minds was, well, let's figure out who did something to anger God. That was the natural question. And Jonah kind of raised his hand and jumped overboard. That was, that's a, a deeply powerful way of thinking. And so the, merit, the, the meritocratic picture of the world, I suppose you could call the, the, the version we find in Torah a kind of cosmic meritocracy, attributes surpassing responsibility to us for everything good and everything bad. Until the book of Job, when Job's, the mourners, are saying to Job, well, you better figure out what you did wrong to deserve the death of your children. And Job can't think of anything he did wrong. And so he cries out to God and God comes and says, actually, you got it wrong. There is a mystery to the way I work. I've got a, a cosmos to look after. I'm not only matching uh, uh, rewards and, and punishments to human beings. I've got, I've got bigger fish to fry. You're not at the center of the, the moral and cosmic universe. So he assures Job that he's not done anything wrong, but he says, you're thinking about this in the wrong way. You have to be open to mystery. Don't think that, and it's a kind of hubris to, to assume that we can figure out exactly who did what and therefore what punishment fell or what reward fell. Well, I'm, uh, I, I, I'm just, uh, fin I just finished this book that you very kindly mentioned, Bill, uh, called The Tyranny of Merit. And by the tyranny of merit, I mean the tendency in our time to assume that those on top deserve their success, that it's our own doing, and therefore that those on the bottom must deserve their fate as well. And this way of thinking, it's a kind of meritocratic hubris, I call it. It's at odds with the humility to which you referred. And it's also at odds with solidarity. Hmm. Because if we really believed we lived in a world where success and failure were entirely the doing of the successful and the less fortunate, it would be hard to muster solidarity or a sense of common purpose or mutual obligation. It would be hard to really believe that we are in this all together. So will the pandemic recall us to a kind of humility in the face of the unpredictability and the power of this devastating event, it could. But all of the pressure in terms of social and cultural attitudes are pushing the other way. So it, it's an interesting kind of moral and civic experiment to see with what the teaching of the pandemic will turn out to be. It's a fascinating question that you've asked. Yeah, yeah. It's about, by the way, I've thought about this a little, this whole question of the biblical voice on this, and I love your interpretation of Job and what is conveyed in that divine revelation that occurs in the book to Job. One of the things that occurs to me that it was part of the original biblical project was introducing to a world in the ancient world and the far east and the classical world which didn't have this notion of writing our own script yeah right no but it was this notion of everything was preordained fated destined still true yeah. in the far east in many ways right and so the Torah and the Bible are introducing humankind to an idea they've never met before. The challenge, which is this, this notion that 
there are consequences of shaping our own fate and there are, there yes. are positive and negative. The problem is, is that it goes kind of far. First of yes, all, it becomes intoxicating. It's, yeah. it's enormously important, this an insight, the idea of writing our own script, of human agency, of individual responsibility. And of course, we don't want to extinguish that. And that's an, an important insight of the Torah. And yet, we also know uh, that it can be intoxicating, that it's, it's easily, it, it, we, we inhale too deeply yes. of our own success when we're in the grip of it. And then we lose any sense of appreciation for mystery, contingency, vulnerability, humility. Mm. Mm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and we're going to need that to be schooled in that and to be challenged for that going forward. By the way, I do want to make space. We're, we're just out of the point where, where we have about a little less than 20 minutes left. And if people have questions, they can communicate with Robbie, uh, who's administering us. Uh, we're going to try to make space for them. I do want to um, ask one other question about the way in which we frame moral questions, Michael, if I may, that, that relates to the kind of um, uh, uh, what I want to call a, um, a situational association with what we actually face when we face a moral question. For instance, the question of, um, of uh, uh, machines that would help people breathe who are right. acutely um, afflicted by the coronavirus and there are only a certain number of machines. And so the question is, um, when somebody presents themselves at an emergency room and they have a need, all kinds of questions. And I remember listening to a wonderful conversation you convened globally, internationally with some wonderful thinkers that all took different positions, not only about somebody's age, about how much value they are to the society, what their job is, um, yet the 20 year old might end up becoming a mass murderer and the 90 year old may end up be having put so much into the economy and be a war veteran and a national hero. And so um, my question is, we deal in these concepts and we engage in these very important moral conversations. But when reality presents itself, that is what I like to, what I'm calling situationally, a decision yeah. has to be made. To what extent uh, do we, as human beings, for instance, as physicians that have an honorable and merciful calling, um, take all of those broader concepts that are very, very important and that have informed our thinking and essentially put them behind us and then meet the need right then and there? Yeah. Because it's what's presenting itself. We're not sure. looking at statistics, we're looking at a human being in the entryway of an emergency room. Yes, of course. Um, we do have to make hard, sometimes very hard judgments in the here and now, sometimes on the spur of the moment. I wouldn't say that means that we put our principles entirely behind us I think what happens in those moments mm -hmm. is that we, we have to interpret the principles and figure out how they bear and, and if they conflict, how to, to reconcile the competing demands on the situation at hand. And that requires moral imagination. Mm. Um, it seems like a kind of practical judgment, almost sometimes a snap judgment, but it involves, for those who do it conscientiously, drawing upon the accumulated uh, wisdom that comes from being steeped in moral principles or mitzvot, moral reflection, yeah. and grasping the feature of this situation hmm. uh, in a way that helps guide us in knowing which of the principles is relevant. And so, I mean, this is something familiar, uh, this 
element of practical judgment with its moral dimension. It's a feature of Buddhic reasoning in a way, which is all about interpretation. Yes. So when, when we do Talmud, we're dealing with practical cases and dilemmas. And it's not that, as if we're really putting the principles behind us. Right. The principles, are, well, I suppose you could say are behind us in the sense that they form a background, mm -hmm. a background understanding to the interpretive debate that we engage in when we do Talmud, or that the doctor in the emergency room uh, finds herself engaged in when trying to decide uh, who should go on the, the ventilator if there are not, are not enough ventilators. Yeah. And so it is a kind of, it involves moral learning, it draws upon moral education, it draws upon the principles, but not as if principles came already fixed uh, in a way that enabled us to simply plug them in to a practical situation. That's the, the situational aspect that you emphasize, Bill, in the question. Yeah. Brings out the fact that no principle, even the Ten Commandments we're discussing this evening, they are not self-applying. That's why we have this long and rich interpretive Talmudic tradition yes. to figure out what they really mean in yeah. practice in relation to this case or that. And so that is not only a way of solving practical dilemmas, it's also a way of coming to a clear understanding of what those principles mean in the first place. Wonderful, wonderful. Excellent, thank you, Michael. I, I know we have a question from Jack Eiferman who wants to come forward with a question for you, Michael. I believe, there he is. So um, I was wondering, it's really picking up off your um, most recent point. There's a vaccine that gets invented. Um, right. I, I was initially going to ask, how do we, um, what does the line look like? And then I, the question got refined to, um, how should we decide what that line looks like and who should be making the decision about that? You mean, Jack, if there's a limited supply, not enough right. for everyone? Presumably on day one, not everyone can get it. Right. Yeah. Well, that's, that's exactly one of those questions that um, embroils not only doctors and public health officials, but also all of us as citizens in some very hard choices. Uh, one principle would be to say the most vulnerable should be first in line. Mm. Those who are at the greater, greatest risk of suffering serious consequences should they contract the virus. Others might say, what about the frontline medical workers whose well-being will help the entire community contend with this? crisis. Others might say, a life is a life. And who are we to pick and choose who should be protected first? That principle would suggest doing it by chance, by lottery. Mm. So here are three principles, Jack. Now, this may not be a satisfactory answer, but uh, vulnerability and need uh, essential service to the community, say the, the medical care providers, or every life is equal, we do it by lottery. These are three possible principles. There may be others. And I think we're in for some, some real debate when, when this scenario, which is, I think, more than hypothetical, confronts us. Mm. Mm. Indeed, indeed. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Michael. I know that Next question, um, I'm not sure if that's Sarah or someone else. Let's invite another question from our participants at this time. Sarah Luria, yes. 
Sorry, it's Tom on Sarah's computer. Sorry, Tom. Good. Excellent. Your question, Tom. Thank you for being with us. Well, uh, thank you for this, this wonderful event, and thank you for this uh, great presentation. My question was whether, coming back to what you started with, the question of, of serological immunity and getting immunity certificates, are we sort of in a, in a privileged position now when we don't know who would be a winner and who would be a loser in that arrangement, and that therefore we're sort of morally obliged to make that decision now before we're doing it out of necessarily any, any self-interest. Right, right. It's a fascinating suggestion, Tom. Uh, and there's a lot in that, I think. Because uh, once we have a keener sense of uh, what the interests are and who, uh, who is immune and who isn't, then it's going to be very hard to avoid special pleading. And what you've pointed to, Tom, is actually um, an influential way of thinking about justice generally, that the way to think about principles of justice is to ask, what principles would we agree to if we didn't know where we would wind up, whether, we, whether I would be rich or poor, healthy or unhealthy, strong or weak, and so one powerful tradition in moral and political philosophy is exactly along the lines that your question suggests that maybe we can think more clearly about this before we know who will be in what position. Very powerful. Great idea. Great suggestion. Um, and uh, thank you, Michael, for affirming it. I know that we have another question um, coming up. Let's see. Sorry, it's hard for me to, to read. And I'm Yantif. I'm not doing anything to, uh, to make it easier. So our next question will follow. This is this question. This is Robbie here. This is a question from CB. Uh, CB doesn't uh, want to be on camera publicly. So I'm going to read the question for them. Uh, Hello, what are some ways what are some ways you envision we as a society can release the grip of the tyranny of merit and move to an ethos that balances and values agency with mystery and contingency right so um so a cb wants to know uh, how do we strike this this um moral balance or um equipoise between a sense of individual agency and self-command, mastery on the one hand, while preserving a sense of mystery, contingency, and humility on the other. Well, that's it's a vast project. And um, I think we have to start, to try to do that, to strike a better balance I think we have to start where we are now. And where we are now is with an enormous imbalance in the direction of believing that the successful have done it on their own and they deserve their place, they're masters of their circumstance, and that the less fortunate have no one but themselves to blame. If that's the dominant way that our society thinks about social and economic arrangements, and it seems to me that is the dominant way. Then we have to try to uh, ask, what are the resources to uh, uh, invite people to call that into question, to reflect critically about it? What are the ways of making vivid to people, including those who may partake of meritocratic hubris, uh, to, to make them, to make us more alive to the luck and contingency to the gifts and the blessings that enabled us to have what we've managed to achieve. So in a way, it's a project of moral and civic education. But I also think that the shape of public institutions and policies can, uh, can help us uh, have that discussion, have that debate. In some ways, every time we decide what the tax policy should be or who should be helped, 
and under what circumstances. We implicitly take a stand on these questions about the extent to which the successful are responsible and therefore deserving of the rewards they've reaped. Mm. Um, but I think uh, uh, the main answer I would give is that we need to lean against the, the, the bent of our time, which puts excessive emphasis on um, the idea that I made it on my own, it's my own doing and uh, to shore up the resources, the moral and civic resources that recall us to a kind of humility and solidarity that would enable us to say, as we can't really say of our society today, that we are all in this together. Mm. Mm. Wonderful, wonderful response. And we're looking forward to reading about this subject um, uh, come September when, when your book uh, is out, and I'm sure you'll be speaking a great deal about it, Michael, because as the question implies, as your answer makes clear, we have a long way to go uh, before we can, we can get uh, on a path that looks like we have that kind of humility, that kind of a, a solid commitment to solidarity, which again, in a world of winners and losers, there is no such commitment. That's a very right. uh, breakup of solidarity is, is in that frame. And I love how you've talked tonight about moral imagination and about the Torah of the COVID-19, what that will be. I, I wanna give you space for a, a final thought. And then I wanna conclude back where we started with a thought about the, the uh, first commandment of, of the 10. Um, actually, let me share that now, and then I'll give you a space yep. to sort of close this off. And that is, uh, Rabbi Heschel used to say, when it comes to hubris, and when it comes to the I and the mind, 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 in the sense of the sovereign self, as it were, yeah. that we have learned to say and recognize every I, that is the letter I, except the I of God, Anochi. Mm which of course is the first word of the first commandment. And that if we can find a way somehow, recognizing how far we have to go um, to, uh, to recognize our humble sort of relationship to the ultimate I, right? Yeah. The anophy, then perhaps that's a first step to recognizing um, who is sovereign and, uh, and, and, and who is decidedly not. I think that's a beautiful way of, of uh, putting it, Bill. And I, I think uh, Rabbi Heschel was very much alive to the themes that we've been discussing. And we've been talking about moral education and redirecting our attitudes. Um, I think what you've suggested is one way of beginning that kind of reflection. Because if, if, if we think about what the Torah teaches us, on the one hand, and the tension is built right in, mm. because on the one hand, it teaches us humility toward God. We are not sovereign. And yet, the Torah also teaches the idea of covenant, that we are partners, that we are human agents, that we are able to even argue with God. And that's the element of responsibility. Um, and this tension between the the Torah teaches us again and again the complexity of this tension of holding both of these perspectives in view. The covenantal sense of responsibility and partnership, that's a, an empowering, even heady idea. And yet it has to stand and live in a kind of tension with humility. We can't come to, to think that because we are partners in a covenant, that we are therefore sovereign. Mm. 
Yes. And whenever we veer in that direction, and it happens time and time again, whenever we veer in that direction, we're brought up short. Mm. And we're reminded of the mystery mm. that exceeds our capacity to, to control or even grasp. So one way of contending with this moral challenge in our society at a time of great inequality, at a time of COVID pandemic, may be to reflect on the indispensable aspects of both of these points of view, sovereign self-command, individual responsibility, and humility, appreciation of the contingency of the mystery of things, keeping those perspectives in our minds can inform, ideally it can inform, the way we think our way through and live our, our way through together mm -hmm. this challenging moment. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, your words and your message, Michael, are really profound. This has been a really rich session. You remind us not only of the, the importance of a dynamic of mystery with mastery, but I'm reminded again of one of Heschel's favorite statements that we're not destined to be a master, we're destined to be a partner. And, and, uh, and with your work and tonight's contribution, which is quite significant, we are well on our way, I hope, to appreciating that difference and then to going out and trying to live it. Thank you so much, Michael Sandel. Much appreciated. Chag Sameach, everyone. Next session will now follow. Chag Sameach. Chag Sameach, Bill.